This week, join me on a quest to learn the truth about a 3,000-year-old temple of doom, complete with sacred idols and secret rituals. The ruins of the ancient civilization of Chavin have stood for 2,500 years, but we're the first to make a full-length documentary here. How did this empire endure without the use of weapons and warfare? Was it a utopian society, or was it a warped experiment in mind control? My search for answers will take me through secret tunnels, deep within the Amazon jungle, and into the hallucinogenic rituals of a modern-day shaman. And one other thing, there really is a temple of doom. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. It's kind of eerie. I've come to South America to investigate a mysterious relic that's thousands of years old. Some think it holds the key to understanding a mysterious underground temple and its bizarre, mind-warping cult. They were a crucial part of one of the most unusual civilizations in history. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein, and I'm on a quest to explore what might be a real-life Temple of Doom. My journey begins here in Lima, Peru. I've come here to see an ancient, sacred idol, perhaps the most important artifact in a country rich with archaeological treasures. It's called the Teo Obelisk. The centerpiece of the National Museum of Archaeology, the obelisk is a huge granite sculpture with images woven together like a tapestry. Professor Guillermo Koch, a leading expert on Peru's archaeological past, explains the crucial role the relic played in the ancient civilization of Chavin. It contains you know, the main elements uh, that were the basis of the Chavin ideology, the Chavin re religion. Is this obelisk considered a god? Is there is this a reason that it's sacred that people of Chavin would actually pray to? It may have well been. No, some people believe that this was a sort of God and that they came and pray and make offerings to them. It's a very important uh, piece in the Chavin culture. The first great Peruvian archaeologist, Julio C. Teo, discovered the artifact in the ruins of a massive temple complex 250 miles north of Lima. He called the civilization Chavin after the nearby town Chavin de Huantar. Reigning from 1000 to 200 BC, Chavin is one of the oldest and most mysterious cultures in Peru. The obelisk sat in the exact center of the circular plaza, at the heart of the complex, a position of supreme religious significance. Teo thought it contained the key to solving the mysteries of Chavin and what went on there. The principal image on the obelisk is a caiman, a South American relative of the alligator. Engraved within the caiman are many snakes, and a feline figure that's thought to be a jaguar, and plants, manioc, peanuts, and chili peppers. I do believe that because the complexity of the elements is a stone with a message. It's like a Bible, you know, like an ancient Bible for these people. So we know it's important, but we don't know what it says. There is a code that we have to break in order to understand what it really means. The strangest part of this code, according to Guillermo, is that the images on the obelisk don't come from the high Andes where it was found, but rather from the Amazon jungle. But the jungle is far from Chavin. In the days of Chavin's glory, it was a punishing six-day trek by foot and llama train through towering mountains falling steeply to dense, impenetrable jungle. Why would a people who live 12,000 feet above the Amazon make jungle animals and plants the main characters in their Bible? Guillermo tells me if there's an answer within the obelisk's code, I'll have to go to the jungle to find it. My starting point is Iquitos, a market town on the Amazon, 500 miles from Chavin de Huantar. Iquitos is bustling. Goods from all over the world arrive by boat. 
I've arranged to meet up with local legend Richard Fowler. He's a naturalist and jungle adventurer. A lot of the artwork at Chavin looks like jungle animals, jungle plants. So I've come here because I want to explore the jungle and hopefully see some of these. I want to know if that's possible. When are you ready to leave? I'm ready to leave right now. Well, I'm a naturalist and that's what I do. Plants, animals, Amazon. Let's go. Let's go. As we travel up the Amazon, I think back to what Guillermo told me. Many archaeologists, including Julio C. Teo, interpreted the obelisk as an origin myth. The Cayman gave birth to Chavin's universe, the animals, the people, and the plants. But why did they pick these particular plants and animals to put on the obelisk? Near the river, we visit a garden cultivated by the Bora, an indigenous people of the region. The plants they're growing here appear prominently on the obelisk. Yucca, or manioc as it is sometimes called, and chili peppers. Will any of these plants grow in the highlands, or are they strictly in the Amazon basin? Uh, these are all tropical plants that grow well in poor soil. <laughs> they're coming, yeah. So yeah, if they don't do well in highland soil, what are they doing as central images on the Teo obelisk? Is this the right color to eat? Yeah, that's, yeah. that'll be just right. OK. <laughs> Spicy. <laughs> that's really hot. I can see now how chilies are impressive to the people of the Amazon. That's a powerful flavor. And yucca is their staple food source. These plants were of vital importance here. Okay, it's, a, it's a starchy product from the Amazon. Yet they don't grow in the highlands around Chavin. Why are they on the obelisk? It's very strange. Sweet. Thank you. The mystery deepens. Julio C. Teo and generations of archaeologists after him thought there was a simple explanation. The civilization of Chavin came from people who migrated up from the Amazon. They brought with them the cultural memory of the things that were important to them in the jungle. Like the Cayman, the central image on the obelisk. Richard is taking me to meet one. There's supposed to be about an eight-footer in here, and that's the one I'd like to try to catch for you. Okay. There's a lot of small ones. I'm sure there won't be a problem catching a small one, but we want to try to catch that big one for you. This is how Richard has caught big caiman in the past. And he says there are some huge ones in this murky water. But so far, the ones I see are like something you'd buy at a pet store. There was one over there a minute ago. Looks like a muddy exercise in futility to me. This takes sensitivity. Anything. Feel anything? Nice. So far, all Richard has found are some leaves, mud, and a lot of aggravation. They're elusive creatures. Always one step ahead of us. And then he gets one. Get the big one back, nah. But he seems a little small. Not much of a father figure. I got you a brown caiman. One of three species found here in Peru. Can I hold him? Yeah, yeah. Hold him. Hold him, please. So what you do grab I do? Him by the head, firm, grab him firmly behind the, behind the head, okay. and firmly at the base of the tail. Don't get your face close to his mouth. This caiman's oh, sort of yeah. cute. Although not the friendliest personality. Don't get your face it's hard for me to imagine this little guy as the main figure in any culture's Bible. But Richard assures me that his brothers and sisters can be a lot larger and more dangerous. In the Amazon and in, in almost all tropical areas where crocodiles are, uh, are found, there's a, they're a powerful uh, animal symbol. You know, like uh, danger, they mean aggressiveness, they mean strength. And uh, people are afraid of them. Why would they be afraid of them? Were they, were they killing and eating people? Uh, they've seen them grab other animals, and they're, they're afraid it's going to get bigger and eat them up. And this is a small one. Uh, this is a baby. A baby. This is only about like, two and a half years old. So one that was nine feet, and some of them said get 18 feet. Well, the black came and gets up to 18 foot. They have a very powerful uh, force on them. And mm -hmm. of course, some of the animals that you're looking for are these 
power symbols, power plants, power symbols, mm -hmm. power animals. Okay, so I'd imagine that an 18-foot black caiman would be a scary sight. Richard takes me deeper into the jungle in search of other power animals. It grows thicker and more impenetrable. Hey, Josh, check this out. Then Richard surprises me. This is definitely a power animal, a symbol worthy of immense respect. Anaconda. The anaconda is the biggest snake in the world, up to 28 feet long and three feet around. This one's a 15-footer and very heavy. Aggressive? Uh, they're defensive. Defensively. Defensive, yeah. They, you get one in close quarters, they, they bite. They just strike at you. And then in terms of, again, local fear, would this have been hunting people? Is there a reason why they'd fear the anaconda? Yeah, they'd fear it because it gets bigger. And there are actual counts of them uh, eating people, like small children and small women. So again, going back to the time of Chavin, any jungle dweller would have feared an anaconda. Sure. It's one of the, the greatest symbolic animals here. The whole legend of the Amazon is like, the Amazon is one big anaconda, and all the little tributaries are baby anacondas. Now I see what Richard means by power animals. A really big snake makes a powerful symbol, strong enough to stand in for the life-giving Amazon, the biggest river in the world. The snake must have held some equally powerful meaning for the people of Chavin to have such a place of honor on the obelisk. Julio C. Teo thought the jungle images proved that people moved up from the Amazon and created Chavin. But Richard tells me of another competing theory, that it wasn't the people who moved, but the ideas. The jungle symbols were so powerful and exotic, they were adopted by a people to whom they were completely alien. To find out the truth about Chavin's origins, I know where I've got to go next. Chavin de Huantar itself. I'm trying to discover what made the mysterious Chavin empire tick. I trace the origins of images on a sacred relic to the Amazon. And now I'm in the northern Andes Mountains, approaching the town of Chavin de Huantar. It's seldom visited because of its isolation. Over 100 miles up steep winding roads from the coast to the west. And to the east, it's hemmed in by some of the highest mountains in the Andes, many over 20,000 feet high. Here in Chavin de Huantar, the influence of the people's Incan ancestors is still apparent. They speak the old language, Quechua, and practice traditional agriculture. But it's still very different from the jungle world I've just visited in search of the images on the Teo obelisk. From the town, it's a short walk to the site. The 2,500-year-old ruins are beautiful centered around a sprawling temple made of massive stone blocks. It rises 53 feet high and looks down on 15 acres of sweeping plazas. To explore Chavin, I've arranged to meet Dr. Rosa Rick, co-director of the Stanford University project here. All over the site, we see the images from the jungle, jaguars and snakes. What are they doing up here in the highlands? But the connection between the Amazon and Chavin is just one of many mysteries that surround this ancient civilization. Chavin is complex and impressive, but I notice a strange absence. Rosa, I'm amazed at, at the beauty and the power I and mean, the wealth that was put into Chavin, everything here. And yet, what I don't see are fortifications. Did they have any here? No. Nope. Did they have a military? Nope. So how is it that they're able to, like, to protect all these assets if they didn't have a military? That's a very good question. After years of excavation and research, the story is beginning to emerge. And it has to do with the special nature of Chavin itself. Chavin was a major ceremonial center. This is where population from all around the Indian area will converge. How far would people travel to come here? Hundreds of uh, kilometers really? to get here. So this was a major pilgrimage site the way Jerusalem or Mecca made. That's right. It's a religious center. But what brought pilgrims to this inaccessible valley high in the mountains? 
Archaeologists speculate it was hypnotic mass rituals on the main plaza, with hundreds, maybe thousands of worshippers. The staging of the rituals was like a multimedia event. The priests had thought of every way to impress and amaze their followers. Traded from hundreds of miles away, special conch shells were blown like trumpets, and their music reverberated off the walls of the temple. Five years ago, the Stanford team found 20 of these instruments, beautifully decorated with carvings. But the power of the ceremonies came from more than just music and dance. Rosa takes me to the circular plaza at the top of the complex to explain a brilliant special effect created by the priests. According to Rosa, they harnessed a nearby river and diverted its water into canals throughout Chavin. This canal comes from up underneath the steps. It keeps flowing, and it opens up to a series of canals that we go all to the ceremonial center. It's like a big speaker, loud sounds coming through this. Wow, so it sounds everywhere. Roaring sounds. It was a remarkable feat of engineering. Over two miles of underground canals traversing the entire temple complex, all to heighten the effect of the ceremonies. The sound must have been overwhelming. That's incredible. So this, this whole space, I mean, with the temple behind us and the water rushing through underground and then coming back here, it's just this whole area was, again, a ceremonial center. This reinforces that something significant is going on here. That's it. This was why Chavin had no military. It was on sacred ground. It ruled by the power of its rituals. Its protected cult status shielded it from attack. Archaeologists have found offerings that were brought by devotees from as far away as the coast. The accumulated wealth supported a huge settlement for its time and place, over 3,000 people. A thriving community of artisans served the needs of the priests. Chavin pottery, goldwork, and textiles have been found hundreds of miles away to the south and to the north. The Chavin style of intricate design and strong animal imagery dominated the entire region. It was a cultural empire in Peru for 800 years, ruling through the persuasive force of its ideas. And Rosa tells me the priests used a unique method to help maintain their dominance. You have a priest representation here. You can see the headdress with the snake designs. Look at the mouth with the fangs and the hands with the claws. And we observe that he's holding a San Pedro cactus. Rosa explains that when correctly prepared, San Pedro cactus is a potent hallucinogen. Clutched in the priest's hand, it's a symbol of tremendous importance to his religion. It's the key to his power and his control of thousands of devoted pilgrims. I've been exploring Peru, trying to unlock the secrets of the mysterious civilization of Chavin. Manipulating powerful symbols from the jungle, priests controlled a religious state based on elaborate rituals involving music, dance, and psychoactive plants. Christian, what's your specialty? Christian Messia, co-director of the Stanford Project at Chavin, tells me more about the priest's use of hallucinogenic drugs 2,500 years ago. And the archaeological evidence is startling. Wow. Oh my god, look at all this stuff. Sitting in a shed, protected from the weather, are many of the stone heads which once lined the temple complex. Yeah, there's one in particular I wanted to show you. Yeah? Yeah, which is this one. Uh, this one here, huh? Exactly. So what's so special about this one? I mean, you see that? Oh, yeah, this. Mm hmm That's mucus. Mucus? Exactly. OK, wow. That's a bit weird. Why do they represent this person with mucus? Well, when you consume uh, psychoactive substances uh, through the nostrils, you get that like, mucus flowing. Ah. And they actually captured the mucus coming out of his nose mm -hmm. in stone. 
Exactly. So what role did these hallucinogens play in the society? Well, what, I, what we believe here in the project is that it was a, very, a really important part. It's so important that it was depicted on the facade on the main temple, at the most sacred place in Chavin de Winter. I've never seen anything quite like this collection of stone heads. So was this I asked Christian to show me where they were 2,500 years ago. Evidence, which is the tenon head, is the only now, head. only one is left in its original position. It was part of the whole wall. It was inserted in those holes that we see along the wall. And this, this tenon head, particular tenon head, is representing some form of transition between a human being and a jaguar. So this is, yeah, half feline. I can see it. It's got the teeth and the mm -hmm. mouth and the feline. Mm -hmm. But I guess the head, the eyes are human, yeah? Exactly. OK, but what is it? Well, we assume that the divinity was living in another world. So in order to get to that world, you have to consume some sort of substances. They will lead you. They will put you in a state of mind. They will lead you to that world in order to enter to that world. Actually, this represents the transformation from human to feline. Exactly. There and that go. was done through taking a substance, some sort of mm -hmm. hallucinogen. Mm -hmm. Wow. A society that surrounds its most holy center with sculptures of hallucinating jaguar people with mucus coming out of their noses is truly bizarre. And Christian has more to show me. We have found just like two days ago these snuff tubes. You have to be very careful, extra careful. They're very delicate. OK. That we found in a canal. Snuff tube? Yeah. Wow, this is a bone, yeah? Probably it's a bear bone. Dozens of these bone snuff tubes have been found in Chavin. Sometimes intricately carved, they were used to inhale powdered hallucinogens. Tiny mortars and pestles were used to grind up the psychoactive ingredients. Some were from the Amazon jungle, like the seeds of the yopo and the resin of the varola tree. What Rosa and Christian have shown me changes my perception of Chavin and its rituals completely. And the story becomes stranger and stranger. This is the saga of a cult built around hallucinogenic plants, the cult of Chavin. The ceremonies on the outside were just the beginning. From the circular plaza, Rosa takes me up enormous steps which created the thundering noise of water flowing through canals. Up until 2,200 years ago, priests used the same stairway to lead a chosen few initiates into an actual temple of doom. And, of course, in every proper temple of doom, there has to be a terrifying idol hidden inside. Yes. The temple above ground is just an entranceway into this massive labyrinth. Huge stones were used to build over two miles of tunnels. Would there have been candles in this passageway? We don't have evidence of candles used at that time. Mm -hmm. There is no signs of the smoke on the walls. It's kind of eerie. I'm surprised by what Rosa just told me. I've been in tunnels like this in Mexico and in Egypt. But there was almost always evidence of the use of fire to light the way. How did they see where they were going without torches? They would have been in complete darkness. So is there any sense of what was going on in rooms like this or down here in the corridors? This may have been to bring some of these initiated people and to break them down. So more of like the cult of Chavin. The initiates were down here in the darkness being reprogrammed by the priests? That's right. For Rosa, it's a classic psychological technique. Disorient people in order to brainwash them and to prepare them for what they were about to see. Oh, wow, and there it is. It is the supreme deity of Chavin, a god in stone illuminated by a single beam of light from a tiny ventilation shaft. Archaeologists call it El Lanzon, the lance, because of its shape. It's unlike anything I've 
ever seen. An intricately carved, massive face with its lips curled in a perpetual snarl. So these initiates would come down this dark corridor. They're in altered states of mind due to some drugs. And they come in here, and they're standing face to face with this really psychotic looking god. So this, this is just, this is a very powerful figure. Why are spirits overwhelming? It must have been a psychedelic blur of fear and awe. In the dark, the sound of water rushing past through acoustic canals would have added an element of heart-pumping dread. This sort of stormy sound. On top of everything that they're going through, they're hearing this thundering noise in front of this guy. That is one other reason for them to be fearsome of this figure. The God is talking to them. I can only imagine what they must have been experiencing. It all seems so bizarre pervasive use of hallucinogens, ritual ceremonies in dark underground tunnels, brainwashing. How would such techniques enable Shabin to become a cultural empire? Rosa tells me I may be able to see that for myself, since some of the methods of the Shavin priests are still in use today on the Pacific coast. Images carved into a sacred relic took me first to the Amazon jungle then into the depths of a 2,500-year-old temple of doom. I've learned that Shavin's existence depended on religious ceremonies fueled by a variety of mind-altering botanicals. But how? My best lead at this point is a hallucinogenic plant called the San Pedro cactus. I travel 140 miles from Shavin to the old colonial city of Trujillo near the Pacific Ocean. Trujillo is a bustling and prosperous city, seemingly very modern in everything but architecture. But could it be possible that religious traditions, which began in Chavin 2,500 years ago, still flourish here today? In the city square, I meet Doug Sharon from the University of California, Berkeley. Go meet a uh, curandera in the market. Doug yeah, is taking me to meet Julia Calderon. She's a curandera, a modern shaman. Some people know them as folk healers. Julia's father was a famous curandero, and she carries on the family tradition. She leads us into the main market of Trujillo, where people buy vegetables, clothes, electronic gear, and practically anything else we come to a stand that specializes in goods for curanderos, like San Pedro cactus. But buying San Pedro is not simple. It's like a fine wine. It must be mature and come from a good region. So is this a good one? Or this is a good one, yeah. One with the scar tissue is one of the best ones. Is, is mature. Is we right. end up with four cactus buds, but that's just the beginning. We also need perfume, lots of it and special, strong tobacco. From the jungle. Yeah, it's good, strong stuff. By late afternoon, we're walking through a quiet neighborhood. The sea is just a few blocks away. Everything seems very normal. Preparations for the evening ahead begin immediately with the ingredients we just purchased. The San Pedro is cooking away. And it's the juice that you take, that you drink okay. during the session. Julia sets up her mesa, a table which contains everything she'll need for the ceremony. Images of Jesus are next to ancient healers. There's tobacco mixed with water perfume, corn flour, and healing staffs, each with a special power to cure a particular ailment. And a magic circle with a six-pointed star inside it, where the patient stands while being healed. This man believes he's been cursed. It upsets his balance, and he has difficulty staying upright and focused. 
The ceremony always takes place at night. Julia purifies the four corners of the ritual space with lime juice and perfume. After cleansing the patient, she invokes the staffs, searching for the proper one. Then it's time to drink the San Pedro. It's part of a group experience dedicated to healing. First, Julia then her assistant. The patients, Doug, and finally, me. It tastes like a bitter, earthy tea. Why the glass three times around the head? I have no idea. But when in Peru, the San Pedro is meant to open the patient up to what's hidden inside, and to allow Julia to understand what's causing his problems. With the San Pedro taking effect, Julia goes into a trance, and she sees a plot to bewitch her patient. She sees a woman. She sees the woman who comes over here to the left. There's also a man. So most of the people who are coming here are coming not for necessarily physical ailments. No. But more not spiritual. At all. Spirit. Not at all. Psychological. So this is a much more spiritual cleansing. Exactly. Julia's skill is treating ailments typically unacknowledged by Western medicine. Curses, charms, and negative energies. Julia has given the patient the proper staff to help restore his power and his balance in the world. She then prescribes a treatment. Be very careful. Don't accept food from anybody. It's all for vengeance that did this to him. That's a very common type of curse here in the North. As part of the ceremony, all the participants, except Doug and me, pour liquid tobacco into their noses. It reminds me of the startling jaguar heads I saw in Chavin, the ones with mucus running out of their noses. In Chavin, they were taking substances that caused this muc the mucus membranes yes. to uh, erupt, basically. Well, we, we're here we're taking tobacco through the nose. We don't know if they're doing that in Chavin, but we know that tobacco is not Christian, and it's definitely Native American. And the major origin of tobacco in the New World is the eastern side of the Andes, right in this general area. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Doug is sure these rituals have something important to tell us about Chavin. You look at these ceremonies here, and in spite of the persecution of the Inquisition and 500 years of colonial rule, these curanderos and curanderas had a great deal of prestige at grassroots level. People come from all over the place to come to these healers. I think that's evidence of the fact that there's a continuity around the San Pedro that goes right back to Chavin. And I think the reason Chavin was so successful as a cult center was because it was built on a grassroots tradition, just like this is today. Building on that very powerful grassroots tradition, they were able to then build a political superstructure on top of that. Mm. And that, that that's a big part of what Chavin is all about. And a large part of that has to do with San Pedro Cactus. Huh? Right. This evening, the persuasive power of these rituals has been made very clear to me. The same shamanic tradition that Julia uses for healing was exploited by the priests of Chavin to gain absolute political and social power. Participating in a religious ceremony under the guidance of a prominent anthropologist, I had a unique opportunity to experience something of what the initiates in Chavin experienced. About 
Three hours or four hours after I drank that glass of San Pedro, uh, the effect reached its peak. I started to get very sensitive to light. I started seeing a halo on all the lights around me. And I was here back in my room, and I thought, well, what would it have been like for these people at Chavin to be feeling this way in the darkness? <laughs> this is it's kind of weird, but here's what, I, here's what I did, is I went into the bathroom here in my room, and I turned out the lights. Because I was thinking at Chavin, so much of that world is based on darkness. And I put a towel under the door to block as much light as possible. And then thinking about El Lanzona and the thundering, resonating water chambers around it, I turned on the shower. And so now I had this water hitting the tub, making this noise, complete darkness. I could see, because my pupils were so dilated, I could see everything. I mean, everything in this room, despite there being almost no light. And it, it made me realize that relative to Chavin, their world of darkness was not one where they couldn't see. Under the effects of San Pedro, that whole underground world became visible. You could see everything. Now, I finally understand how the priests of Chavin could have an elaborate world of ritual in the dark. In 500 BC, the power of these mysterious, hallucinatory ceremonies was strong enough to control a spiritual empire without the use of a military. I've been decoding the symbols on a sacred relic to understand how the ancient Andean civilization of Chavin flourished for 800 years without a military, without city walls. In Chavin, I learned how the ruling priests conducted elaborate rituals, fueled by hallucinogenic drugs to control an entire culture. I participated in a modern day version of one of these ancient ceremonies and came away with a deeper understanding of the priest's power. But was Chavin's systematic use of mind control unique? To answer this question, I'm traveling 230 miles south to the little-known site of Caral in the Supe Valley. I meet up again with Guillermo Koch, who explains that Caral was discovered in 1905, when an archaeologist noticed huge mounds in the desert. Like Chavin, Caral has a circular plaza, but much, much larger. Corral is also a great deal older than Chavin. What's really exciting to think about is that at the time of the Great Pyramids of Egypt, this city was thriving. And what has archaeologists really excited is that it carbon dates to 2600 BC, 1600 years before Chavin. Corral is like Chavin in many ways. Like Chavin, this vast complex was an important ceremonial center. Corral appears to have no fortifications. Archaeologists have also discovered snuff tubes, clear signs of ritual use of hallucinogens, like that at Chavin. These similarities suggest that a culture like Corral might have spread to Chavin. But there's one big difference. Unlike Chavin, which is high in the mountains, the sea is only one day's walk from Corral. That gave Corral an economic resource that Chavin lacked, fish. During the time of Corral, the Pacific Ocean here was teeming with fish. The Humboldt Current coming up from the bottom made these waters frigid and rich. This coastline had some of the greatest fishing in the world. The bountiful ocean, combined with improved fishing techniques like these reed boats, triggered a population boom. It led to the development of complex societies like Corral. These boats may be the technological innovation that fueled the rise of Peruvian civilization. It's amazing that fishermen today still use the same techniques. I'm going to try it out myself. Pacific Ocean, wintertime, cold water. The boats are kind of like big kayaks, very maneuverable. Today, we're going out just to play around a bit, but the working fisherman would place his catch in the back of the boat and spend all day out on the water. Mm -hmm. 
these little boats are perfectly adapted for riding the swells, and they allowed fishermen thousands of years ago to harvest the ocean. The real fun is getting back in. Instead of just going over a wave, you have to ride it. We had a great time. Gracias. Gracias. Ah. Gracias. Whew. Okay. All along the coast, there are fishing communities. And all along the coast, archaeologists are finding the ruins of civilizations like Corral that exploited the sea. From these roots, the origin of Chavin and all Andean civilization is becoming more clear. 80 miles up the coast from Corral, Guillermo shows me an even older site, Las Aldas. Here, too, I can see similarities with Chavin. Okay, and this is the circular plaza which I've seen in other sites. Exactly, and this is a very complex one. And it looks fairly unexcavated. Yeah, uh, it has been barely excavated some 40 years ago. So they've made some sample cuts and that's it? Exactly. Okay. Is there evidence of a connection between Chavin and Las Aldas? Was there use of hallucinogens? Did crowds gather at the circular plaza here for mass rituals? The simple answer is, we don't know yet. This is from fires over here? What it's was from it? cooking. Cook is the cooking area. Thousands of years of cooking. Things just waiting to be explored as an archaeologist. Doesn't that make you crazy? It makes my mouth watering. No? There's still so much to uncover here. Who knows what secrets lie buried under the sand? Finally, we get to the top of the temple complex. On one side, a sheer cliff drops hundreds of feet to the ocean. And on the other, the massive building extends into the desert for almost half a mile. To create a structure like this required a sophisticated civilization. Guillermo tells me that the picture which is beginning to emerge ties these ruins closely to Chavin. And this corroborates no, the new hypothesis, the new ideas about the origin of Chavin. Remember that Tello thought that Chavin was the birthplace of no, Andean civilization and that the origin was no, in the jungle. Civilization came from the jungle into the highlands. Today, no, the hypotheses are completely different. We think that no, Andean civilization grew from the sea. Uh, so because they had the food source here on the coast, the this allowed the civilization to grow to the point where it, it could do and build this, basically. The great richness no, of the Peruvian sea. And that civilization moved from the coast into the highlands. From these Pacific settlements, fueled by a unique maritime economy, civilization spread inland eventually reaching Chavin. But one question still remains. Did Chavin import its techniques of mind control from Las Aldas and Corral, or were they developed in the mountains? We don't know for sure. The answers may still lie within the pyramids of Corral, under the sands of Las Aldas, or maybe even hidden in the code of Chavin's mysterious obelisk. This week, join me as I explore the most mysterious stone ruins on Earth, Stonehenge. I'll take to the air for a bird's eye view and descend deep into local Stone Age mines. I'll test the tools that might have moved the giant stones and meet one man whose journey from a foreign land changed the Stonehenge world forever. All on a quest to find out who built Stonehenge and why. We're digging for the truth and we're going to extremes to do it. It's a lot smaller than I expected. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein, and for most people, this is as close as you can get to Stonehenge. But I think you and I deserve a closer look. 
so follow me. Stonehenge is one of the most famous prehistoric monuments on Earth. Never really discovered, it's always just been here. Before the English arrived, before the Romans, long before written language. A ruined circle 100 feet across, 30 miles north of the English Channel, in the heart of a rolling countryside. Stonehenge has been here, full of secrets, for thousands of years. There are stories of grand ceremonies, of foreign forces from beyond, and others closer to home. Some people claim that Stonehenge sits at the center of a mysterious energy field, and that its makers were tapping into this energy source, which is undetectable by modern science. This idea received a big boost several years ago, when mysterious crop circles started showing up in the English countryside near Stonehenge. There's just one problem. Crop circles are a hoax. We know this because the people who made them didn't just confess, they even showed us how they did it, using a piece of wood, a piece of rope, and some creativity. From local cults to modern mystics, many groups have tried to claim Stonehenge for themselves. But the real story begins more than 5,000 years ago, when an ancient culture picked a place to leave their mark on the Earth. And the mark they left is much bigger than Stonehenge alone. This is part of Salisbury Plain. This is part of the chalkland of Wessex. And this is what people have called the Stonehenge landscape because there's so much around Stonehenge. Archaeologist Julian Richards led one of the most comprehensive studies of Stonehenge and its landscape to date. And we've got a great view. He wants to start by showing me that the land around Stonehenge is dotted with burial mounds like the one we're standing on. You know, somewhere underneath here is the burial of somebody who knew Stonehenge. But Stonehenge is surrounded by much more than just graves. Artworks. It's parts of boundaries, field systems, burial mounds. It represents really about two, two and a half thousand years of prehistory here. That and there is... Some of these earthworks are even older okay. than Stonehenge itself. That's that Paint. Part. It's a bit like a lot of the things in this landscape. They're quite difficult to see at ground level. You really need to get up as high as you possibly can and look down on this landscape and see what's going on. What I thought was a mysterious monument turns out to be the center of a prehistoric world. And there's only one way to take it all in. Well, I'm at the airstrip. It's a beautiful evening. Should have perfect light to see Stonehenge and the other features on the landscape around it. The area around Stonehenge, just a few square miles, has the highest concentration of prehistoric remains anywhere in Britain. But how they all fit together remains largely a mystery. Archaeologists know a few things for sure. The oldest part is this long, straight track called the Cursus. It was thought to be a Roman race course until it was proven to be more than 2,000 years older than the Roman invasion. The barrows, all burial mounds, contain bones as well as jewels of copper and bronze. There are hundreds of these round graves with an eye shot of the centerpiece, Stonehenge. This is far more than just a ruin. Stonehenge represents a whole culture. And I'm on a mission to find out exactly who these people were. Fortunately, I can follow a trail left by more than 60 years of excavation. More than half of Stonehenge has been excavated, beginning in 1901 and continuing periodically until 1964, when a decision was made to preserve what was still untouched. Archaeologists learned that even here, the story begins outside the stones. So this is the earliest part of Stonehenge, is this ditch and bank that runs all the way around it. And we've got a pretty good idea about when it was dug. Really? Yeah, radiocarbon dating. What were you dating? Fire pits? No, no. The great thing is about ditches that are dug 
back in prehistory is that what people dug them with are these yeah. antler picks. It's a chunk of red deer antler. Mm -hmm. Makes a very good pickaxe. The people who dug the ditch out left some of their picks on the bottom of the ditch and we can radiocarbon date those. And because there were lots of them and we can get lots of radiocarbon dates, then we know that this ditch was dug between 3000 and 2920 BC. So we've wow. got an 80 year date rate, period. which is actually pretty good when we're going back 5000 years. So they dug this whole ditch. Thanks to the discovery of antler picks, yep. archaeologists can say almost it's exactly when Stonehenge began. It was first a huge round ditch with an opening to the northeast. It was dug into soil of chalk that would have shown bright white. But could such simple tools really dig a ditch so big? Well, it's pretty straightforward. By raking through it, I can get it to crumble. But what's really cool is to think that 5,000 years ago, in what we now call southwestern England, people were using these very tools to dig through chalk exactly like this and create something amazing. During the late Stone Age, also known as the Neolithic period, antler picks were used for digging across the Stonehenge landscape and far beyond. Archaeologists believe that the 150 antler picks excavated at Stonehenge were used only for digging shallow ditches. Here at Grimes' grave, 200 miles northeast of Stonehenge, those same antler picks were being used for something completely different. Technology in Neolithic Britain was moving forward. There are more than 400 Stone Age mine shafts on this property, and each one holds vital clues to understanding the Stonehenge world. Even before the Great Ditch was dug at Stonehenge, miners here were on the hunt for flint, the greatest resource of their age. Another dark hole. Ancient technology is going to lead me to the builders of Stonehenge. Wow. And archaeologist Kathy Tuck believes key evidence as to who these people were can still be found down here. Kathy, how would this have looked different? 5, years ago. Well, when it was first cut, it would have been absolutely gleaming white, because you can see we've got quite a lot of Teams stone. of Stone Age miners toiled here for more than 1,000 years, and they dug these huge spaces out with the same simple tool. It's incredible. Aren't these fantastic? So what we've got here are 5,000-year-old mining tools. Look at that. And just to be able to see the wear patterns on these, you have to visualize that this was actually used to make these excavations. And in fact, in some of the galleries and tunnels, we've actually got the marks of where you can actually see where individual swipes have been taken into the chalk face where they've been striking. So you really can get a feel for what, like not just what they were doing, but where they were doing Ooh, it and how oh, they were doing yeah. it. Absolutely. But one of the most exciting things that we've got are um, in some compressed clay and chalk on the antlers, we've actually got some fingerprints, thumbprints from the miners who were using them. 5,000 year old fingerprint. Mm, yeah, absolutely. That is so cool. So can we Once the miners them? reached a depth of around 30 feet, they dug tunnels radiating outwards. These go in quite a long way. They do get very narrow. Are you okay? Oh, yeah. So, That's about as tight as it looks. And it's cold and kind of clammy. But other than that, it's quite nice. This is the stuff that they were after. A great big nodule of flint here. Wow. So it looks white on the outside, but as soon as you start cutting into it, you get this beautiful black, shiny material, the silica and marine sediments that's been compacted. Obviously, this is important enough to, mm -hmm. to dig all this out. So what's the goal here? Yeah, well, what, they, what they're doing here is um, they, they, this is their, they're, they're coming after the raw material of a whole new economy. A new economy based on mining and trading in flint became a driving force in the Stonehenge world. But what was so important about Flint? I'm on a quest to unravel the mysteries of Stonehenge. Who built this amazing place and why? I took to the skies to learn that it's the center of an entire prehistoric world. And I crawled deep into a Stone Age mine to discover that a new economy based on flint was transforming the Stonehenge landscape. 
Before the Neolithic period, what we now call England was covered in thick forest, and nodules of flint were turned into axes to clear it. There's an axe in there somewhere. Flint Sorry. axes formed the backbone of a new Stone Age economy. But I start by investigating the stone to see if there's any imperfections that I don't know about. The process of turning a nodule of flint into a blade is we'll called flint that. napping. Yeah, there it is. Nice one. As a survival instructor, I've done some flint napping myself. But John Lord is a master. He's been perfecting his technique for more than 30 years. I now set about reducing this with smaller tools, scaling down the process. Don't think for a minute that John's just randomly hitting that stone. This work is extremely precise. You can see that this finished blade has a midline. And it runs halfway through the weight of the thickness of the blade. So John is going to be evaluating where his midline is on this piece that he's working. It's technical. It's, it's, this is, flint napping is a very technical art. And he's a master, and he's making it look really easy. But in the hands of a novice, that stone would shatter and break, and you'd lose a lot of hard work. And he's taking minutes. It might break on me yet. Oh, <laughs> <We'll> see. <laughs> but it's taking him minutes to do what he's learned over many, many years. And it's fascinating to watch. It's like chess. Kind of, oh, nicely done. <laughs> Look at yeah. that flake. That's a good flake. If you've never seen flint napping, this just says he knows his stuff. With a little know-how, flint can go from stone to axe very quickly. Looks like you're almost done. Yep, well, I think I'll settle for that. Yeah? So this is a fully finished blade, but this only took you about 10, 15 minutes. In just a few minutes, a skilled craftsman can make an axe blade out of flint. And over many years, these blades reshaped this landscape. During the late Stone Age, the trees of England were cleared on a massive scale. People who had been wandering hunter-gatherers settled into communities. They planted crops, and they began raising animals for food. A little more. All because forests could now be turned into farms. Ah. Hi. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah. Tool held <laughs> up. Thank you. That was an experience. You've done a good job there. And the blade itself looks OK? Blade's fine. No damage at all. This new stone technology ushered in an equally new lifestyle. People settled and began to farm. And they cleared a place in the trees for Stonehenge. On site, Stonehenge began as a giant ditch. Now I've come back with Julian Richards to find out what happened next. What happened after the ditch was made? They put some timber structures up. There was a circle of timbers here, just inside the inner edge of the bank. Really? Yep. 56 posts, large timber posts, were put up. One here, one there, one there, one there. So a, a, a circle all the way around. The 56 timber posts have long since disappeared. But early on, Stonehenge was a ditch and a circle made of wood. How did they know that there were timber posts here? Because when the archaeologists dug here, they found pits that were dug into the solid chalk. And by looking at the sort of soil that fills them up, you can tell whether there's been a post there. And quite what this was, you know, whether it actually had, you know, timber lintels on top, or whether it was just almost like 56 totem poles stood here. Sure. Of course, we can't we tell. Don't know. Okay. No. We can only imagine what Stonehenge looked like as a monument made of wood. But valuable clues to its function can be found at another monument fewer than two miles away. Aha, Woodhenge. Yep. So Stonehenge, Woodhenge, it's maybe kind of silly, but what's a henge? Julian explains to me that henge is a name archaeologists have given specifically to these kinds of circular prehistoric earthworks. The plan is very similar to Stonehenge in terms of all these concentric circles, but you know, there's one or two. Each of these concrete markers stands where a timber post once did. I mean, up until about 1920, this was thought to be the remains of a huge ploughed burial mound, but then people started to get up in the air taking photographs, and this, when it was under plough, showed up 
as all of these dark spots, you know, each one of them marking the position of a timber post. So somebody thought, right, this It turns out Woodhenge was discovered the same way I first saw it, from above. And at the very center, archaeologists uncovered a dark secret. What they found here was the grave of a child. Really? Yeah. This child appeared to have had its skull split. Purposely? But it looks as if it was possibly some sort of a sacrifice. Sacrifice? It may be that flint axes had a more chilling purpose than clearing forest. But why? Like, what, what kind of ritual is going on here that people need to be sacrificing children? It's very difficult to try and work out exactly what sort of rituals went on in a place like Woodhenge. You can imagine people sort of processing around the different circles. And when they were excavated, there were different objects found in the different rings of post holes. So some of them had highly decorated pottery. Some of them had animal bones, which might indicate that people were feasting here. And then, of course, right in the center, you've got this burial. A lot of work went into cutting and moving these timbers. What was the point of Woodhenge? Woodhenge is a bit like your local parish church. You know, there's a lot of efforts gone into building this, but it's a timber structure. When you compare it to something like Stonehenge, where the amount of effort is just so huge because they've replaced all the timber posts effectively with ones of stone, then, you know, if this is a parish church, then Stonehenge is a cathedral. Were there any prehistoric sacrifices or burials found here? No sacrifices, but there are actually quite a lot of cremations, cremated human remains found here. Really? Yeah. It turns out there's proof people at Stonehenge were creating a space intimately connected with death and human burial. So in the same holes where the timbers stood, they found remains? Yeah, and it looks as if they must have been cremating people quite close to here, because you don't only find the human bones, but you find the ash as well from the funeral pyre. So they're dumping them in the top of these pits and also in the bank and in the ditch. So there would be bones. And was this place then a graveyard? Well, at some stage, early in its life, before all these great stone structures were built, then Stonehenge was a cemetery. Over a period of nearly 400 years, people here in the late Stone Age used flint axes and antler picks to make a clearing, dig a ditch, and build a burial temple made of wood. But the temple was far from complete. Sweeping changes were on the way for Neolithic people, and a new face for Stonehenge was on the horizon. I'm on a quest to unravel the mysteries of Stonehenge and the prehistoric world that surrounds it. I've learned that Stonehenge began as a huge ditch. Next, a circle of wooden posts was added. But before the great stones were erected, the builders would survive the passing of an era. The Stone Age was coming to an end. And one young man from a world away was beginning a long and dangerous journey. He was an archer and a craftsman. And he traveled with enough skills and knowledge to spark a revolution. He was buried sometime around 2500 BC, just three miles from Stonehenge. In 2002, Dr. Andrew Fitzpatrick excavated the grave. It's his teeth that do the talking, because they tell us that he was brought up a long, long way away. When we grow up, our teeth lock in a chemical fingerprint of the environment, and we can say that he came from a much colder place, somewhere around the Alps or Central Europe, and he traveled from there, eventually, to die near Stonehenge. It's an astonishing story, all from his bones. Around 2500 BC, this journey through Europe and across the English Channel would have been fraught with unknown dangers. But the archer succeeded in his passage and became a very important man in his new home. It's his mourners who make the statement about how important this man is because they buried so many things in the grave with him. A rich burial would have been counted as somebody who had 10 things placed in his grave. This man has almost 100. Along with pottery and Stone Age tools, the archer's grave contained metal, the oldest worked gold ever discovered in Britain and three knives of copper. 
The archer's grave also proves that he traveled with the knowledge to make these things himself. What is like the most important thing in here? The most important thing is the thing that looks most ordinary. It's this simple black stone here. And this stone tells us that the archer was a metal worker. We find tiny traces of copper and gold in these stones, so we know for sure these are metal workers' tools. The archer came from a place where knowledge of metalworking already existed. But Andrew believes metallurgy was just being discovered in Britain. And how does this relate to Stonehenge? He's a contemporary of Stonehenge, right? He would have seen Stonehenge being built. He would have seen the stones arriving. He would have seen all this epic engineering exercise. And I think what he does bring is something new, and it gives the opportunity for a new order. That's the connection. Two things almost coincide, a great temple being built and the introduction of metal. To understand how metal was transforming the Stonehenge world, I need to head north once again. This time to Wales. During the transition from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age, copper became the most precious resource. To help me learn more about how it was actually mined, I've come to the Great Orm Copper Mine in North Wales. The Great Orm was being actively mined during the building at Stonehenge. It's one of the oldest mines in Europe, and amazingly, it's the largest copper mine in the world. Nick Jowett leads the excavations here, and he's agreed to show me around. Yeah, it looks like we're going down here, aren't we? That's it, yeah. That goes down quite a ways. Can I go first? Of course you yeah. All right. You hold it. Tally ho. I'll see you down there. God willing. The copper mine at the Great Orm was discovered in 1987. This thing is huge! It became immediately clear to archaeologists that the mines here were organized on a scale which exceeded any mining operation ever seen before. Excavators have removed more than 100,000 tons of mine waste from these giant shafts and tracked them down more than 200 feet below ground level. That's really cool. This is the first time I've ever actually repelled into a cave, much less a copper mine. And it's right at this point, actually, where Nick is now, where I felt this temperature shift to the coolness of this cave. And probably, wow, he's, he's gone pretty quick. We're probably now like 30 feet below the surface. Welcome. Enjoy that. This is great. <laughs> oh, this is great. So this whole room, right, this chamber we're standing in, was solid rock at one point. Yeah, that's right. It would have been, it would have been just solid rock with veins of uh, malachite, copper ore running through it. Probably about three main veins uh, running through here. But you, when you see the size of this place, you can just imagine how much uh, copper must have come out of here. And all by hand. Yeah. We found thousands of stone hammers and 30,000 pieces of animal bone. We believe those are the tools, really, uh, that the people use to dig out you know, this space and the, uh, the, the five miles of uh, other Bronze Age workings that we've... Uh, 30,000 bones and five uh, miles of space. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. It is. And Nick believes the Great Orm could have employed more than 1,000 people at the height of its operation. By contrast, the flint mines I saw at Grimes Graves were worked by teams of fewer than 20, and they operated only one shaft at a time. Metallurgy was dramatically advancing technology here, and the hunger for copper was fueling an organization of labor on a whole new scale. It's, it's actually quite amazing what, what they did leave in here. Nick tells me that all along these abandoned shafts, evidence remains of what all this hard work and mass organization were for. You can see in the walls here. Yeah, this is a malachite copper roll. I guess this whole chamber that we're walking through is what they extracted. That's right, yeah. This was a vein of copper, and they would start outside on the surface where we presume the malachite was exposed on the cliff face, and they just followed it into the ground. When it stopped, they stopped and went somewhere else. Yeah, back out into uh, daylight. Back above ground, I press Nick for the site's best connections to Stonehenge. 
Now, was this site being mined at the same time that Stonehenge was being built? I think almost certainly it would have been, yeah. Um, we would imagine that this area here was being mined around 4,000 uh, years ago. We have dates, though, that range from 3,900 to 2,900 years ago, fitting in sort of very nicely, really, I think, with the construction of Stonehenge. So it's possible that the Amazingly, the less than 5% of the Great Orm has been excavated. 50 or 60 years from now, there will still be people excavating the mines at Great Orm. Wow, now that's exciting. So there's still, still exciting things to be found. Yeah, very much so. Should we get started doing it? <laughs> I'll dig there, you dig there. <laughs> Mining at the Great Orm was reshaping society above ground even more than below. As people mastered the art of extracting metal from rock. So I've seen where the copper came from, and now Eddie here is showing me what they did with it. Eddie Doughton is a prehistoric technologist. He's made this simple furnace from leather, wood, stone, and bull's horns. So Eddie, why don't you tell me what I'm doing here? Okay, you crush the malachite up real small, and then that goes into the crucible mixed with powdered charcoal. The powdered charcoal reacts with the malachite and heat, lots of heat. What do you think, another hour? About another 15 minutes. Keep blowing. It took thousands of men to mine the Great Orm, and archaeologists estimate that almost 2,000 tons of copper ore were removed. Millions of pieces of jewelry and highly valued ritual ornaments were created. Just keep on blowing. Whatever you do, keep blowing. Desire for these items fueled an economic expansion unprecedented in the Stonehenge world. That's it. That's pure copper. Julian, how important was copper to the people who made Stonehenge? Well, Stonehenge was being built in stone at the time that the first metals were coming into this country. And clearly, what they did was they gave people a lot of wealth and power. Because if you could smelt metal and you could trade in it, then you were going to be wealthy. I mean, look, if you come and have a look over here... Images of metal tools adorn the stones at Stonehenge. And metal would have adorned the leaders and organizers of the project, too. Here's a dagger. That's an axe. I mean, these are metal tools. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think this is people decorating the stones with something that's very precious to them. You know, these days, people wear a, a flashy wristwatch, don't they, or right. some gold jewellery, you know. Back yeah. at this time, you'd have had a nice, shiny bronze dagger or a shiny copper axe. As a status a, symbol. A status symbol, yeah. During the late stages of building at Stonehenge, definitions of wealth and power were growing and changing all around it. New symbols of status and importance were emerging. But the greatest status symbol of them all was being built in stone. I'm on a journey to figure out who built Stonehenge and why. I've discovered an entire ancient world, straddling the age of stone and the age of metal. I've learned that Stonehenge was first a ditch, and then a circle of timbers, all made with tools of bone and stone. And I've learned that new metals were changing the Stonehenge world while the stone circle was being built. But I still don't know how these huge stones got here. I'm amazed to learn that nearly half the stones at Stonehenge came all the way from the west coast of Wales. Archaeologists have confirmed that the first stones which were brought to Stonehenge came from this very property. It remains scattered with the same stones, spotted dolerite. Seeing this environment up close drives home the difficulty of the task the Stonehenge builders had to face. Archaeologists estimate that 80 bluestones were used at Stonehenge. That's over 300 tons of rock that somehow made it 150 miles to the east. But the mystery remains how did they get there? In an age before the invention of the wheel, moving these stones would have been a truly monumental task. At the very least, they would have needed rope, and I want to find out how they made it. It's time to go back to the toolmakers. 
If the builders of Stonehenge had it, then John Lord and his wife Val can show me how to make it. Val is a primitive technology expert just like her husband. She's brought me to their backyard and she's told me that we will soon end up with rope. Quickly snap it, she says. Like so. And always start at the edge of the metal patch. Don't try putting your arm over there because your body will get stung and your arms will get stung. Stinging nettle is a common plant in this region. It releases a burning acid when touched. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> got me. But Val seems to have found a way around it. Just hold it very, very firmly near the top okay. of the metal, like so. Like so. Painless? Pretty painless. There are yeah. more than 100 species of this plant native to Europe, Asia, and North America. It's been a critical resource for early peoples across the globe. So what we do is open it like this. So you'll probably find some bugs in there as well. Ah, oh, lunch. Quite often, yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So you have to snap it so that we can get the center out. The soft the outer skin becomes a yeah, tough raw and, um, material. That's your fiber, which you use to make the string. Oh, your piece is much nicer. OK. So we need to produce a bunch of this. Definitely yeah. do. Yeah. OK. Once enough is gathered and stripped, then the raw materials are twisted and strengthened. You know that one, do you? Yes, I do know oh. this one. I'm going to spin the thread away from me, then pull it down. Spin this cordage away, pull it down. All the tension is being held here by this finger, pinching these fingers. So spin. Pull. That twisting motion is called a reverse wrap because you're reversing the wrap That's right. back on itself and creates a very effective tight cord and you can test it by trying to unravel it, spin it the other way, and it won't. It won't it'll actually hold that tension. And have you seen this? Making if you cordage. fold it in half. There are many ways to do this, but the end product is the same. This is for doubling up. Yeah. Rope from plants that were here so in the days of Stonehenge. Down. That's our first piece. And then this was our second, a little thicker. We just double that over. Yeah. And then third. And if we wanted to make rope, we would just keep going. There awesome. it is. You can you see. Bit of rope you can trust. And it didn't take long. How long did it take for you guys to make this? This is 40, 45 minutes' work. Yeah. And so if we had a lot of people, lot of everyone people, doing this, we could nettles. create uh, and a lot of nettles. We right. could, good, uh, good, strong rope. But I want to test this rope myself. Don't do it, though. What do you think? I think it'll take you. It'll yeah? Be, yeah. Let's see. A few plants twisted together in 45 minutes. Oh, yeah. Pretty good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it holds my weight. So that worked. I mean, obviously, though, I weigh a lot less than a megalithic stone. That's right. But if we kept doubling ropes over and had enough people, we could have raised something as big as Stonehenge. Could, obviously. Could, I mean, yeah. they did. Yeah. We knew that. But this is what actually shows us what they were using at the time. Yeah. Right? So rope is done. But could strong rope and flint through. axes do everything the builders needed at Stonehenge? So I've seen they had the technology in bone and stone to make digging and cutting tools and to turn plants into cordage and rope. The question is, could they put this all together and actually move the massive stones at Stonehenge? There's only one way to find out. Julian seems to have every connection a Stonehenge explorer could want including a place with lots of big stones to experiment with. Now, this is about the same size as one of the blue stones from Stonehenge. Okay. So it weighs over two tons. Yeah, we're and to we've got ourselves some manpower, too. These guys are local rugby players and young farmers, and they've agreed to help out for the day. I want to give us some sort of goal. So I'm going to actually set up a finish line and we'll have to pull it as quickly as we can across that line. Ready and pull! And go! So experiment one, aborted. Uh, it didn't work terribly well, did it? <laughs> um, well. You know, we could shift it, but yeah. with about 20 people, but I think there were better ways of doing it. Julian thinks workers at Stonehenge built wooden sleds to haul the stones. 
by the time that they, they built Stonehenge, yeah. they'd already been moving fairly big stones to make some of their earlier stone tombs. So this was something that they were quite skilled at by right. this time. Okay, I'm much, more, much more yes. skilled than we are, yeah. yes. <laughs> we're doing our best. Yeah. One, two, three. A sled would reduce friction between the stone and the ground, which would make pulling easier. But apparently not that much easier. Oh. Well done. Well, hang on, that was 55 seconds to move it yeah. five meters. Five pieces, yeah. and they, the and sled helped, but not enough to make this an efficient job. So it would have taken so, hang on, uh, yeah. <laughs> millions of years. Well, I think they'd probably still be on the way. We're bringing in some modern technology. But I'm learning the architects at Stonehenge had some pretty advanced technology themselves. There's evidence of people building wooden roadways, wooden trackways across marshy areas, for example, even earlier than this, with quite sophisticated carpentry. So I don't think it's actually beyond the capabilities of these people to build wooden trackways. Again, we just got to make sure that we have the same distance. Should be five paces from the front. Yeah. A wooden sled on a wooden track should reduce friction even more. A lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Not <laughs> much so much easier. fun, though. <laughs> okay, you guys, you all ready? Yeah. Are you ready to time it, Josh? Ready. Okay, and pull. Oh. Whoa! The builders of Stonehenge seem once again to be far more advanced than I ever imagined. A little quick. <laughs> yeah, a little, a little too quick, really. Yeah, I thought I was going to get squashed, but... Yeah. I've seen firsthand how these people mastered the art of transporting massive stones, using only the natural resources at their disposal. And I know from the mines at the Great Orm that this advanced society was assembling labor forces in the hundreds maybe even thousands of workers at a time. I've learned a lot about the people who built Stonehenge, and now I'm ready to find out why they did it. I'm nearing the end of my quest to find out who built Stonehenge and why. I've tracked evidence of its builders on site and learned they were a people in a time of great change. At first, the builders were a Stone Age people, clearing the forest with flint axes, and digging with bone tools. But they soon left the Stone Age behind and entered the Age of Metal. And as if to commemorate that success, they erected these massive stones. This place remains a monument to these people and their achievements, but it's also much more than that. Stonehenge is an astronomical observatory, one of the very first ever built. And when you walk in through this... And I've come back on site with Julian Richards to find out exactly how it worked. Julian, I see some of these stones have fallen over. What would this place have looked like if everything was perfectly standing? What we think it would have looked like, and obviously it's quite difficult to tell exactly, is, is firstly there would have been an outer circle of uprights, of big uprights of sarsen. The big stones at Stonehenge, called sarsens, were arranged in a circle 100 feet across supporting a fully connected stone ring 16 feet off the ground. And then inside that is another circle, this time of the smaller blue stones. Some 60 blue stones, averaging just over six feet tall, were arranged in a second full circle, 75 feet across. And then when you move further in, you get into two horseshoe shapes. And this, is a, this I think, is the most impressive part of the structure. And see one? two, three, that was another one there, and that was the tallest one of the lot, because they graduated in height up to the back of the horseshoe. 
This massive arch marked the climax of construction at Stonehenge and was the centerpiece of the fully completed monument. It took nearly 1,500 years for Stonehenge to evolve from a simple ditch and bank to a structure made of wood and finally to a fully completed monument with an opening and long processional avenue facing northeast. It's in this very specific orientation that a purpose for Stonehenge has been discovered. Where we're standing here, this gives us a very good clue because we're not quite at, at midsummer now, are we? But the sun rises in that direction. That's the entrance into the, into the earthwork enclosure. And the sun would have shone on midsummer day, the longest day of the year, straight into the middle of Stonehenge. The alignment through the center of Stonehenge demonstrates that the people who built it understood something of enormous cosmological importance. These people understood the cycle that results from the Earth's annual rotation around the sun. And they understood that the longest day of the year, what we now call the summer solstice, could be recorded with light and shadow and stone. This would have been a moment of great ceremony at Stonehenge in ancient times. And it's marked by celebration still today. After all I've learned about Stonehenge, I've come to end my journey on the summer solstice to honor this place and this very special sunrise. I'm back at Stonehenge, and there is electricity in the air. Thousands of people have come for the solstice. It's 4 AM, and every hour we get closer to the sunrise, the energy builds. Just a few hours from now, sunlight will shine along the avenue, through the main gates, and onto the ancient altar at Stonehenge. Today is June 21st, the longest day of the year. It's a day that proves Stonehenge was a kind of early calendar. And it's the only day of the year when the general public is allowed inside the stones. Using Stonehenge as both a temple and a tool, its builders were able to track the sun and the seasons, gaining knowledge that was critical to their survival. I've seen my share of sunglasses, but this one, it's got to be one of the most magical. Stonehenge reminds us that all life revolves around the cycles of the natural world. It was built to track these cycles and to honor them. And through this great monument, its ancient builders live on. Join me as I explore a fascinating story right here in America's backyard, the great earthen pyramids of the Mississippians. In the 16th century, the Native American empire brutally fought and defeated the powerful Spanish conquistadors. Who were these people and how did they do it? Some archeologists suggest these mounds hold the key. Join me as I paddle down the bayous, build my own pyramid, and dive into the cold, murky waters to solve the mystery of America's pyramids. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. I don't know if they did it too far. In 1539, the Spanish conquistadors landed on the banks of Florida to embark on a conquest of North America. Led by Hernando de Soto, the conqueror of the Incan Empire, they intended to find gold and silver and set up the first Spanish colony north of Mexico. 
For almost two years traveling in the southeast, the conquistadors wreaked havoc among the natives, capturing or killing many of them in their path. But as they moved farther west, the native villages began to resist and fight back. Then in 1543, the fighting escalated into an epic battle on the water. This bayou is just a few miles east of the Mississippi River. It was in this region where the battle reached its peak. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein, and I've come to western Mississippi to explore how the natives in this region were able to launch a sustained attack against the Spanish and effectively send them fleeing to the Gulf of Mexico. We know this happened because a few survivors from DeSoto's expedition wrote down their experiences. They're the only written accounts describing the people who drove them out. These writings tell of villages built among huge pyramid-style mounds along the banks of the Mississippi. Who were these people, and how did they stand up to DeSoto's army when the natives to the east did not? My goal is to learn about the people who built and lived among these pyramids. My journey begins with the last occupied pyramid site in North America, located in Natchez, Mississippi. Historians believe the Natchez Mound culture began around 700 AD and lasted for over a thousand years. To learn more about that history, I'm meeting with Greyhawk, a descendant of the Natchez Indians. It's possible his ancestors may have encountered DeSoto. I'd like to invite you in the house and maybe have a, a little smoke. Okay. Greyhawk takes me inside a traditional Native American hut to smoke the friendship pipe. Grass roof huts like this one have long witnessed ceremonies of welcome and peace. When you smoke the pipe, it's a pipe of prayer, it's a pipe of peace, and a pipe of friendship. And when our smoke comes out, and it goes up to the Creator, that's our prayer going to the Creator. We can actually watch it, and then that, that means that uh, if we lie to each other, uh, we don't have to face each other, we have to face the Creator because that's where the prayers and the words are going to. But if we tell the truth to each other, we just enjoy the service. We just enjoy the service. Okay. Greyhawk explains that the tobacco we're smoking is the same kind the natives smoked in the 17th century and is still considered a very sacred plant. To a Native American, it's a great sign of respect to share the friendship pipe. Had DeSoto and his men approached the Natchez in peace, they would have been greeted the same way. So now we can talk as friends. Yeah. Why don't we start with you? Tell me about you and your people. I'm a home Indian, and uh, we are people of the Mississippi Valley. Greyhawk tells me his people don't have written accounts, but only oral traditions of their encounter with DeSoto. According to that tradition, his ancestors welcomed the Spanish with open arms and kindness, completely unaware of the brutality they were to face. When they finally realized the Spaniards intended to conquer their land and disrupt their way of life, they fought back. Greyhawk says to understand how the natives defeated DeSoto, I'm on the right track exploring the mounds. What do the mounds mean to you today? A lot of people want to talk about Columbus and to talk about the Spanish and things like that. That's where they think history starts. And these mounds are linked to a history that goes back farther than that to show people that we were here before and we did have a culture. So I know that there's a mound right outside. Can you actually go to it and you can tell me about it while we're standing on it? Almost definitely. I'd like to take you out to the mounds so All you right. can see what it looks like. Let's go. The mounds were the focal point of the Natchez and other cultures. They were revered and are still places of ceremony today. Wow, so here we are. Yep, this is it, the mounds. Is it okay to actually go up the mound? It's okay, we can go up. Because I'm assuming that this is a sacred area. It is, it's a very spiritual, very sacred area. We used to come up here to pray and they say it, uh, our elders tell us if we uh, Pray in our own language, the Creator knows that we're still here. So I think, you know, it'd be a nice idea for us to pray for the Mao culture. It'd take a minute or so. It's okay. This mound holds special meaning for Greyhawk. The natives who lived here were the last in the region to fall to the Europeans, collapsing in the 1730s at the hands of the French. Oh, to learn more of the history of the mound people, I need to explore the yeah. roots and learn how it all began. If this was the last remaining pyramid village, 
I'm curious to learn which one was the first. I'm heading north, following the course of the Mississippi River to a small town called Lake Mills, Wisconsin. The town claims to have stone pyramids supposedly 5,000 years old. If that's really the case, then these would definitely be the first pyramids anywhere in the Americas. This is Lake Mills, Wisconsin, a town which very much embraces their pyramids. The local motel, the liquor store, even the memorial in the town center all reference pyramids. Looks like I came to the right place. Local legends claim 5,000 years ago this body of water, called Rock Lake, was dry. Standing here, I could have seen the pyramids. I've been told that the rock structures are now in the lake, and the only way to see them is to get in the water. To find the pyramid, I'm meeting Archie Eschborn. He has written a book on the Rock Lake pyramids. We'll be using his boat to explore the lake. Archie says the largest pyramid is only 120 feet long, so we'll be using modern computer technology to help us find it. The computer will display images that should clearly show the shape and size of the mound. Without it, we might never know exactly where to look. We've got the coordinates locked into GPS, but in the meantime, we uh, are going to employ some new uh, size scan sonar technology in a small package. It just came out. It allows uh, just about anyone to be able to have high-tech equipment when they're doing some kind of search. So we're going to have a pretty good high success rate in finding it. Oh, absolutely. I guarantee it today. As we approach the general area, we try to match the sonar with the GPS coordinates. But there's a problem. I think we've got a transducer problem. We'll probably want to just use this one sonar for now. The computers seem to be giving us contradictory readings. Pyramid hunting. Quick trip to the site, not going to happen. Right, right. It's uh, not as planned, but uh, when you have electronics, weather, and people, it never works out the way you want. So maybe uh, kick back, enjoy the scenery, relax a little, get some sun. So we're having uh, electronic challenges. Our, our side scan sonar was just installed this morning, and it isn't quite working the way we would hoped it, hoped it would. We're using another sonar in the front, as well as a GPS unit, and hoping that with the right coordinates and a little bit of luck, we'll get to where we need to be. See how it goes. I'm on a mission to learn how the Native Americans of the Mississippi River Valley in the 16th century ran off the Spanish conquistadors. In Mississippi, I met with Greyhawk, a Natchez Native American descendant. He told me the mounds were the focal point of their culture and are still viewed as sacred spaces today. Now, I'm on the hunt for the oldest pyramid in North America. I'm in Lake Mills, Wisconsin with Archie Eschborn. I'm investigating a century-old legend which claims pyramids were constructed here 5,000 years ago. Today, the pyramids supposedly sit below the lake. We've been searching by boat and are having a tough time finding it. But after several hours, Archie spots a formation which he says looks promising. So that bump is what we were looking for. Absolutely. You can see that it's approximately the size that we've dove on before. So we think we nailed it this time, Josh. Now, I was expecting a pyramid like the Egyptian pyramids, which is this big pointy thing. And that looks more round to me. Well, the imagery will fool you, but you're not going to get an Egyptian pyramid down here. What you're going to get is a longer truncated one. You go to the south end, you'll actually have, it'll look like a pyramid, and there'll be like a tent shape. To investigate whether what we see on the sonar is really a pyramid or just a natural pile of rocks, I decide to go down for a closer look. Archie, you don't want to come with us? No, no way I'm going in that stuff. No? That's why we got expert like Steve to take you down. What do you know that I don't know? It's just cold and dark and I don't like it. Cold and dark. <laughs> cold and dark isn't a problem for me or my gear, but visibility could be a challenge. In the summer, this lake is notoriously murky. Down below, visibility quickly drops to a frustrating 5 to 10 feet. I descend 25 feet and see a huge pile of stones, what Archie calls a pyramid. Some rocks suggest organization like they were placed here by human hands. But just looking at them, I can't really say if this formation was created by people or by Mother Nature. 
I decide to search for artifacts or any markings which might indicate human creation. But I find nothing. Since this is regarded by local natives to be sacred, I won't bring the rocks to the surface for closer inspection. Ah, that was great. Ah, ah. The, uh, the surface about the top, say 15 feet, warm, maybe 80 degrees. But once we got below, and it got dark. And then, as I approached the rocks, I don't really have a good sense of what I actually saw. I saw a lot of rocks. I saw some cool fish, but I didn't get a sense of the shape. But here I am, in the middle of a lake, and there are rock mounds below. Go figure. Now the question is, what do they mean? How do we know that what is down below the water is actually man-made and not nature made. Well, first we want to go to the Indian native uh, legends and stories about what lays at the bottom of this lake. So certainly what we found cooperates these uh, legends. The second is the geological evidence certainly points to the fact that they're not glacial in nature, but they are indeed man-made. And the third thing that we can point to, we found similar type structures throughout the Midwest. They're on dry land, this is underwater, but the structures are fairly identical. Archie makes some interesting points, but I feel I need another opinion. So I call the Wisconsin Underwater Archaeology Association and set up a meeting with their director, Dr. Dick Boyd. I wanted to talk because I, I heard some compelling but not convincing evidence yes. about these formations in the bottom of the lake being man-made. And I've heard there's a lot of controversy, and there's another Indeed. side to the story, and you represent the other side. That's correct. I believe that these are glacial structures. We are in an area where the glacier 13,000 years ago deposited all kinds of strange rock structures and formations uh, around the shores as well as in the lake. How is it, though, that a glacier can make that kind of structure? It would usually be produced within the glacier itself. Dick explains that when a glacier has a crack in the ice, water runs down and carves a bell-shaped cavity inside the glacier. Over time, rocks, sand, and debris fall inside and get trapped. When the glacier melts and moves away, what's left behind is a rock pile that resembles a pyramid. Okay, but this is a much Dick shows me the kind of rocks I was touching than, during my dive. These boulders. And this is he the says they're the rock same rock rocks dive. produced by the glacier that covers here. Wisconsin's uh, landscape. The, um, like Both Dick and Archie make interesting points to support their theories, That's but neither has solid evidence. Upsetting. But it sounds like this mystery of whether or not the pyramids of Rock Lake were man-made or glacially made is going to remain. Yes. And it probably adds to the allure of this lake. But I'm looking for an uncontested, undisputed, man-made oldest pyramid. Where would I go to find the oldest pyramid? Well, in order to do that, you're going to have to take a, a trip to the deep south into Louisiana and go to a place called Poverty Point. I decide to take Dick's advice. I head back south following the Mississippi to investigate another pyramid, this one in Louisiana. For the final approach, I decide to arrive the same way many Native Americans would have, by canoe. For thousands of years, the pyramid builders used rivers and streams like this one as their principal mode of transportation. Paddling their canoes, they traveled up and down the Mississippi River, trading along the way with other Native cultures. I've asked archaeologist T.R. Kidder of Washington University in St. Louis to meet me at the water's edge. He says he can show me America's oldest pyramid. Yeah, give me a hand. Yeah, there we go. Okay. There you go. Welcome nice to, to meet you. Point. <laughs> there there you. you go. I'll take that. So, would this place have looked like this when the natives were trading here? Yes, it really probably would have looked a lot like this. I think most of this dead vegetation would have probably been gone, used for wood, firewood, things like that. But, sure. but basically, yeah, it looks pretty much the same, I think. Nice. It's thick? It is. It's very thick. And that means that uh, you're going to have to use the machete to get up. Oh, we're bushwhacking, huh? Yeah, here we go. We're, we're on our way. OK. So Wait on. ready, we'll head on that way. Poverty Point was built above the floodplain on a natural 50-foot embankment above a tributary of the Mississippi River. 
versus Hawk. I'm Farmer. following in the same Black footsteps area. a trader would have, trying to avoid the alligators, cottonmouth snakes, and other potentially deadly creatures. Ooh, watch out right here. There's a whole mess of fire ants. Okay. Yeah, you want to move quickly through that spot. It's going to get easier, I promise. I don't doubt it. Fire ants, poison ivy, brambles. It's fun. Tiny fire ants typically are not one of my worries, but just 30 seconds after I'm stung, I have a severe allergic reaction. An intense rash covers my body. My face swells. I give myself a shot of adrenaline to help relieve the symptoms. Instead, my condition worsens. I'm now wheezing. I have chest pains. I decide to stop my journey and race to the hospital. I need more serious medical attention to stop the toxins from ending my journey permanently. I'm in a hospital in Louisiana being treated for a severe reaction to a massive fire ant attack. Eight years. In the field, I had difficulty breathing, nausea, and a full body rash. No. Chest pain, chest pain's coming back again. Yeah. Luckily, I had my emergency med kit with me and gave myself epinephrine and antihistamines within minutes. What you gotta do is... Yeah, I like that guy, but it was much worse before. But it wasn't enough to reverse the reaction, so I rushed to the hospital. Four hours after the bite, my symptoms have calmed and I'm feeling much better. How you feeling? Dr. According to Dr. Tucker, my quick know. treatment in the field saved my life. Your reaction was uh, really serious. It's a severe reaction. And if you hadn't taken the epinephrine in the field, yeah, you could have died from it. Die? Uh-huh. Wow. An anaphylactic shock like mine can kill in just minutes. The meds I took in the field gave me the time I needed to get to the hospital. Most people don't make it. That night, I have to stay in the hospital for observation. By morning, I'm feeling better, ready to continue my journey. Well, got a clean bill of health, and I'm good to go back. So now it's just a matter of finding TR and picking things up where we left off. Thanks again, everyone. Where we left off, I was searching for when the Native Americans began building large earthen structures along the Mississippi. I traveled to Wisconsin to investigate what some claim is the oldest pyramid in America, but I found no decisive evidence. I'm now in Louisiana meeting with archaeologist T.R. Kidder, who says he can show me America's undisputed oldest and largest pyramid. Maybe this is kind of a mecca. He tells me Poverty Point was constructed by Native Americans in 1700 BC. How many people lived here? We don't know exactly, but probably 1,000 to 3,000 permanent residents. It's pretty big. Yeah, at that time, it was the biggest site in all of North America and possibly the biggest site in all of the Americas. Wow, that's I, impressive. I think so. I think it's probably the first American civilization when you think about it. These people had monumental architecture. They had trade and exchange, complex political organization, all the kinds of things that we think of with sort of civilized society except for writing. Did they create objects or artifacts that archaeologists have found here? Yeah, there are lots of them, and I've got some that I can show you in a little while when we okay. get up to the mound. That'd be great. TR takes me to the largest mound, reaching over 70 feet high. It's a big mound. Yeah, it is. It's probably the second or third largest mound in all of North America. At the top, TR shows me artifacts they found at the site. Many different arrow points and shards of pottery from places as far north as Wisconsin. Okay, so how far did this travel? Um, I'm going to say about 200, 250 miles. Long ways. Okay. This one is from either Illinois or possibly Indiana, so maybe about 300, 350 miles. Wow. 300, Evidence like this proves this was the hub of a major trade network. Of some sort. Yeah. TR tells me this was the first large Native American mound building community. Having now seen two earthen mounds, I asked TR how the natives actually built these massive structures. Well, we think that they're probably doing it in several different ways. One is they're using things like digging sticks. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't have a lot of stone, remember, so that they're probably using wooden tools to dig the, the earth out. And then what they're doing is they're probably piling it together in baskets like this mm -hmm. and hide containers. And so what you do is you carry it in, 
you dump it over. TR estimates the natives built this pyramid with 20 million 50-pound baskets of dirt carried and dumped by hand. Wow. A lot of work. It's an incredible amount of work. So you haven't actually tried to build a mouth from scratch? No, I've never done that. Well, I got an idea. I'm going to use a little modern technology to see what it would be like to make a mound. <laughs> to give me a sense of what moving tons of dirt actually involves, I decide to build my own earthen pyramid. But instead of one basket at a time, I'm going to use today's technology. The man in charge of these machines is Charles Poole, and he's happy to help me on my quest. So if I want to build a mound right here in the middle, that's the machine I'd want to use? That's the machine you'd use modern days, yes. And it's okay with you if I do it? Yes. And I can try? Yes. Okay. Why don't you load, load me up? All right, here's your hard hat. Okay. Your safety vest. Okay. And a little communication. Great. Damn. That thing is huge. You see, get this thing on. Look, look at this wheel. Huge! It's this big! Let's see how it goes. Charles has given me the keys to a 32 ton, 485 horsepower Tonka toy. One right. huge earth moving machine. Within seconds, I'm learning how to fill the pan in back. He's filling it up. The machine literally scrapes dirt off the ground, which I trap using the pan's lip. Open your lip all the way up so the dirt can come out. To dump the dirt, I push the back of the pan forward. This is called crowding. That's good. Now hit your crowd, Josh. Crowd it out. Crowd the dirt out, man. Come <laughs> on. Drop my load. One pan load drops over 31 cubic yards of earth. To a mound builder, that would be close to 1,800 50-pound baskets of dirt. It takes a while, but gradually, the mound begins to take shape. So I'm taking a break and letting the pros do it. But let me tell you what it feels like when you're in there. You've got this huge machine, just this massive machine and this tremendous load of dirt. While you're trying to empty it, you've got to be careful of, like, how that load is managed. If you push it out too fast, it gets stuck too slow, and it drags out too long. It's a lot. It's a lot to do. These guys impress me. But what also impresses me is just how quickly this works. The mound builders had nothing going on like this. It was one basket at a time. But my goal here is to see how quickly we can move massive amounts of earth to make our own mound. We don't finish until after dark. It's amazing to think, after all this work, using today's largest machinery, we didn't even come close to the achievements of the mound builders. Well, you weren't kidding. We ran out of light. <laughs> that was great. Yes. That was incredible. Yeah. Man, this thing moves a lot of earth. Yes, now I guess we can appreciate what the Indians did back years ago when trying to build their mound, huh? Just how hard it is. I mean, how big is this mound? How tall is it, do you think? 10 foot tall and probably 100 foot long. For the natives to have built a mound this large, it would have taken over 85,000 baskets of dirt. To build a 70 foot tall mound like Poverty Point with these machines, Charles estimates it would have taken almost a month. This definitely gives me a sense of just how much work went into building these mounds. Yeah, that's impressive. In 1539, the Spanish conquistadors' attempt to colonize America failed. I'm on a quest to find out why. I've been told the answers lie in the Native American mounds near the Mississippi River. During my investigation, I found the Native American mound building culture began 3,000 years before the arrival of the Spanish. Eventually, they evolved into a large and powerful empire archeologists today call the Mississippians. My goal now is to learn why the mounds were built and how they relate to the Spanish. The answer may be at the capital of the Mississippian Empire, Cahokia, near St. Louis, Missouri. This is Cahokia. It was the New York City of its time, the very center of the Mississippian Empire. And the best way to see it all is from the sky. To get there, I called my good friends Bubba Peters and Eric DeFour. Morning, guys. Good morning, Josh. Bubba, good, good to, to see you again. Man. Eric, good morning. great to see you. I'm going to fly a powered paraglider, 
basically a parachute with an 80-pound engine and propeller strapped Great. to my back. Radio check, can you hear me? Now better? Yeah, it's good. Can you hear yourself also? I got it, perfect. The weather conditions need to be absolutely perfect to fly. Today, conditions are almost too nice. Warming up solid. We have no wind, which can make it difficult to take off. Okay, step back now. Step back, you're good. Yes. Power, 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 power. Stop, 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 stop. I keep running. Too much rain, not enough running. That's OK. There's no wind, which means I have to run a little bit. And on that one, I just, I, I stopped running. I'm going to give it another shot. And this time, I'm not going to stop running until the parachute pulls me from the ground. Bring it up. Use your power. Power, 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 power. Go, 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 go. could have used more wind, but the wind is not there. So that's pretty good for Josh to be able to do that because he's a young pilot. For an experienced pilot, it's not much of a problem, but it's very difficult condition. Woo! Now that I'm up, I can take the time to explore the site from above. This is great. I can see all the mounds really well from up here. Looking at Cahokia from the sky, helps me put its size into perspective. The mounds were built on roughly 4,000 acres of land. They vary in shape and height. Flying over the largest, I can't help but wonder how much work went into building it. The Cahokia Mississippians must have been capable of a tremendous amount of organization and determination to build a city of this size. Come back left. Come back again into the wind. Very good. Don't move. OK, shut it off. Light, right, and hold. Light. Very light. Wait. Perfect. Wait. Don't move. Oh, that, that was a trip, man. That was a trip. Not sure where Bubba is, but there's this big mound, which is beautiful from above. And then there's a bunch. There's this one here, which we can see, and there's some on the other side. There's a lot of different heights, a lot of different sizes. Great from above, but from down here, my question now is, what does it all mean? That's what I gotta find out. I'm meeting with John Kelly, an archaeologist at Washington University in St. Louis, to learn if the descendants of the people who lived here could have had the ability to defeat DeSoto in the 16th century. He tells me Cahokia reached its peak in 1100 AD, with a population of over 50,000 residents. It was the largest Native American site in North America. The site has hundreds of mounds, each reflecting the status of the person who lived on top. Rank was expressed by the location and the size of the mound. This is the central plaza, correct? Correct. Is there a relationship between the people who had these mounds and their location in the plaza? Yeah, these are the people that had the highest status within the community, either in terms of their religious position or their social position. And the closer they were to this plaza, the more important they were. Exactly. You said you had uh, you had built a mound at Poverty Point with uh, with machines. I had some help. Yeah. You had some help. Well, we're going to let you try uh, uh, the way they did it in the past with this 50-pound basket of, of earth, and I'm going to help you load it up, and you're going to uh, go up to the top. Go up to the top. John has chosen oh. three different mounds for me to climb. He says each mound has a different story. You'll grab the strap. Yep. And pull that over your shoulder. Around the first shoulder. mound is right on the plaza. You all set? Yeah. I'll see you at the top. Okay. John says the basket I'm carrying is almost identical to what was used by the natives. Even the rope is made from local plants. Hello. Hi. You made it. I did. Now let me grab that. Thank you. How high? Yeah. How high is this one? 
This is about 20, 20 feet high. 20 feet, okay, and this is one of the smaller mounds that I can see. Yeah, this is one of the smaller ones on the, on the uh, Grand Plaza, and okay. so it represents uh, an individual that had status, but he was a much lower status in the whole pecking order uh, of the social structure. So the person who lived here had a lot of status, but not as much as maybe the guy over there. Exactly. Well, I'm gonna go climb that one. Well, let's go do it. All right. Here we go. Number two. All right, John. Here I come. This mound is much bigger than the first one. The basket feels heavier with every step. I now appreciate how difficult it must have been to construct a mound of this size. Almost there. This one's a little bit bigger. If size means status, this mound's creator must have been pretty powerful. Almost there. Just a few more feet. Let me grab it. There you got it. Oh, yes, thank you. Oh. So this one's higher, for sure. Yeah, it's about 40, 40 feet high. So twice as high as that one. Exactly. And huge. Yeah, a you lot can bigger. See, yeah, you got a lot of surface space on top, so you can uh, put lots of buildings. This meant that this person had more status than that person. Exactly, and they had a lot more command of labor, you know, in the hundreds uh, of people, maybe in the thousands, who knows? And the highest ranking person is, is straight uh, to the north. East. But the big mound. The big mound. So that's 100 feet. So you ready for that challenge? That's the one I got to do next. Yeah, exactly. OK, cool. Halfway up the biggest mound, I now realize the power this person who lived on top must have had. He must have commanded a large, organized labor force to have built something this big. This is extremely challenging work. I wonder what could have motivated his men to work so hard. Almost there. 99. 100. 100. You made it. I did. Excellent. Turn around. All right. Now we get this off of you. OK. Now you ready to go back down? Get no. another basket? No. How about we sit and talk for a while? OK. So this is the Grand Poobahs, the chief's place. Yes. John tells me the chief had a large house as tall as 30 or 40 feet high from which he ruled his domain. There was a tall pole in the middle of the mound, which symbolized the center of their world. The mound was a political and spiritual icon. The chief was more than just a ruler. His people believed he was a descendant of the sun. The mound was a place where the villagers came to worship and to pray. Cahokia was built in fewer than 150 years. At its peak in 1100 AD, Cahokia ruled over a 50 square mile region. Its influence extended over hundreds of miles more. Beyond the practical benefits of creating housing platforms, uh -huh. could the chief motivate these tens of thousands of people to do something else like warfare? Yes, very much so, because this was all integrated in their cosmology. Okay. Uh, he was looked at as, as a warrior. Uh -huh. Chief was able to mobilize a significant number of, of individuals for warfare. And, uh, and we see that with the construction of the palisade uh, that surrounds the core area of the site at about 1200 AD. Can you show me the palisades? Yes, let's uh, look down here. You can see a reconstruction of the palisade. Oh, wow, okay. And, uh, the palisade surrounded the core area of the site. It stretched for more than two miles around the largest mound and the plaza, defending the most sacred part of the community. What about weapons? Did they find any weapons around the area? Yes, we, at 1,200, we see a significant increase oh. in the number of uh, projectiles. Even okay. though the bow and arrow had been around for several hundred years, mm -hmm. uh, the importance as a weapon, both not only for hunting, but also for killing people in warfare, uh, was a, a significant part of what was going on. And is very closely linked uh, to the construction of the palisade. Uh, that was for shooting at people from a distance. Mm -hmm. However, for close-in warfare, you could take uh, the clubs such as this and, uh, and use that. OK, here, I'll trade you. OK. So this was for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Right. So what would happen if DeSoto and his army, these conquistadors, would actually come up to the Mississippians, who are, looks like, very well fortified and very well uh, armed? You know, what well, happens? Well, I suspect they would have been doomed. Doomed? With the number of people here and their ability to organize and even take on the kind of armament that the Spaniards had, I think they would have had a tough time of it. 
Fortunately for the Spanish, the conquistadors actually arrived 200 years after the decline of Cahokia. However, the descendants of Cahokia still possessed a large population, competent chiefs, and the means to conduct war. So how was it possible that De Soto lasted so long after he reached the Mississippi Valley? What gave the Spanish the upper hand, if only temporarily? I'm traveling through the Mississippi River Valley, exploring the culture of the Mississippian Empire and how they ran off the Spanish conquistadors in 1543. On my journey, I've learned that Native Americans have been building pyramids, or mounds, for thousands of years. One of them, Cahokia, lay at the heart of a metropolis of 50,000 residents. Until its collapse in the 14th century, it was a large empire, as complex as any medieval European city-state. But by the time Hernando de Soto and the Spanish conquistadors arrived, the power of the Mississippians was greatly reduced. Still, they were a force to be reckoned with. After seeing their amazing achievements, I'm curious to learn how the Native American weapons compare to the Spaniard's stock of arms. Was technology the reason the natives didn't immediately wipe out the Spanish? I'm now at Parkin Archaeological Site in Arkansas, where Jeff Mitchum has agreed to help me solve this puzzle. First, he has me shoot a 16th century Spanish firearm called an arquebus. Wow. I bet that would intimidate the natives, huh? It was very effective in scaring the Indians, but the problem was that it took so long to load that they found that actually they weren't of use in, in a pitched battle. The Spanish didn't just bring guns. They also had many other weapons never seen by the natives, like steel swords, crossbows, and most importantly, horses. The horse was the most powerful psychological weapon in the Spanish arsenal. It was alien to the natives. They didn't know how to fight against the large beasts. Their natural reaction was to run, giving the lancer a perfect target. If the horse was the Spaniard's key weapon, I'm curious to learn what did the natives have. The primary weapon was the bow and arrow. Many of their bows were made of a type of wood called bow dark. It's a very strong wood, and it's very good for use in bows. So that's the bow. What about the arrows? The arrows? usually made of cane, and they're tipped with, with uh, stone tips. And then they're, of course, fletched with feathers. Sure. And these were very accurate. They had a, uh, quite a distance on them and also a lot of uh, power. What about armor? If the Spanish have metal to make weapons, couldn't they also have made armor that would withstand the bone arrow? Yes, and a lot of the members of the DeSoto expedition, when they first arrived, they had chain mail. But they quickly found out that the chain mail had several disadvantages. Jeff has set up a weapons test so I can see how effective the chainmail was against the native arrows. Wow. But this is interesting that it actually broke through the chainmail. I wasn't expecting that. That obviously demonstrates that the chainmail would not be effective against the Mississippian arrows. And why is that? Is that because chainmail was designed for other uses? Yeah, it was primarily made for protecting against sword blows. This would actually help absorb a lot of the shock and keep you from getting, getting cut. But the direct impact of an arrow would just pierce the armor. Absolutely. So realizing this, did the Spanish do anything? Any of them had quilted armor that they'd actually picked up in Mexico and brought with them, and they knew from experience that that would protect against arrows. Do you have any quilted armor? Yes, we do, and we can experiment with some of that right. as well. Let's reset and give it a shot. Got him. Two good belly shots again. Wow, oh, very interesting. So your second one made it through a little bit. Yeah, but it didn't get but, through this one. Yeah, and it wouldn't be lethal. So it would just be like a good, a good hit in the stomach. <laughs> It's a lot better than having it go all the way through you. Yeah. This test proves that the Mississippians' most powerful weapon wasn't effective against the Spanish armor and demonstrates the Spanish had the upper hand in both technology and psychology. So how did the natives, despite being inferior in almost all aspects of warfare, finally fend off the Spanish? Jeff takes me to a nearby river. 
He explains in the third year of the expedition, the conquistador's leader, Hernando de Soto, died of a fever and was dumped into the river. After his death, the members of his expedition, demoralized by three years of constant battle with the natives and never having found gold or silver, made the decision to leave and head back to Mexico. They melted down their firearms to use as nails and built boats that could hold as many as 50 men. They stole dugout canoes to hold the horses, which in turn were pulled behind their boats as they sailed down the Mississippi. Once they set out on the river, they had lost any sort of military or tactical advantage that they had. And also, they, they were really disheartened. They had given up, and their idea was just to, to get out by that time. So how do the Mississippians play into this? When the boats finally set sail down the Mississippi, there were well over 100 canoes full of warriors out there, Mississippian warriors. Some of the, and some of these canoes were huge. A few of them held as many as 60 to 70 people. The Spanish chronicles say it was an impressive spectacle. The fleet of canoes were a serious threat. The Indians followed them and were constantly giving them barrages of arrows, 24 hours a day, too, so the Spaniards couldn't rest. The natives lined the banks of the river. If the Spaniards tried to land, they would stop them by firing a slew of arrows. So it sounds like the conquistadors, who are cutting this swath of destruction from Florida all the way through to Arkansas, get here and they finally met their match. Here's this organized society. They have hierarchies. They're building these huge mounds. They understand warfare. And when the Spanish are at their weakest, the epic journey comes to an end. Over the course of three years, the conquistadors had lost over half their men including their leader and national hero, Hernando de Soto. It took 19 days for the surviving 300 conquistadors to reach the Gulf of Mexico. It was considered a monumental victory for the Mississippians. The mound-building culture of North America lasted for over 3,000 years. Why Cahokia collapsed is still a mystery but theories range from drought to warfare to political instability. Today, all that remains of this spectacular, complex society are these sedate, grass-covered pyramids, silent testaments to a Native American empire that once ruled America's own backyard.